Let's go to God in prayer. Father, uh, I pray your blessing upon everything that we have to say today. I thank you that Bonnie is here. Lord, just to bring healing to her. Give her a wonderful time while she's here for a, a wedding, for her family. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for everybody who has come. And I pray, Lord, that we can rejoice in the study of your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the great themes of Hebrews is that Jesus Christ is the author of a new and better covenant. Our Bible mentions the word covenant 292 times. The Hebrew Old Testament uses the word 285 times, literally meaning a cutting. In Old Testament times, people made blood covenants with each other as a way of saying they will honor their word and the agreement that was made. Two of God's covenants with mankind were made with blood. The Old Covenant or Old Testament through animal sacrifices and the New Testament through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Understand the word testament and the word covenant have the very same meaning to it. So you can talk about the Old Testament or Old Covenant, the New Testament or the New Covenant. Now, there are six covenants that God made with his people. So since we're talking about covenants, let's look at all of them briefly. First, there was the covenant God made with Noah, that he would never destroy the earth with a worldwide flood. You see this in Genesis chapter 9. The sign that he gave of that promise was the rainbow. We learn from this covenant that God is trustworthy. He will keep his promise. <coughs> Second, there's the covenant God made with Abraham that through Abraham's seed would come a nation, the nation of Israel. They would be given a land and a descendant who would bless the entire world. And that, of course, is the Messiah himself. Psalm, 180, uh, Psalm 105, verses 8 through 11 talk about this as well as three different sections in the book of Genesis. The sign God gave Abraham of that promise was circumcision. We learn from this covenant that God is immutable. That is, he never changes. The book of Hebrews, as we talked about in chapter 6, he will not change because our God is an immutable God. Third, there's the covenant God made with Moses that was based on the law. His promise was he would bless his people if they would obey him and curse those who would disobey him. You see this in the book of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> the sign of that covenant was the Sabbath, according to Exodus chapter 31. We learn from this covenant that God is holy, and he chose Israel to be a separate and different people from all the pagan nations. Fourth, there was the covenant God made with David, that his seed would endure forever and his throne as well. The sign of that covenant was the virgin birth. We see in Isaiah 7 verse 14. We learn from this covenant that God is faithful as he will not lie. We saw this in Hebrews 6 verse 18. Fifth, there's the covenant God made with the Messiah. That he would be a light to the Gentiles from Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 59. The sign of that covenant was that Jesus would perform miracles. We learn from this covenant that God is love. Sixth, there is the new covenant God made with himself for the house of Israel. He would put his law in their hearts and forgive the sins of his people by Get this, remembering them no more. But when we get to this later on, that this is when I expect a hallelujah, that God, that God remembers our sins no more. Doesn't matter. That's, that's, that, ought to, that ought to get us going. But uh, we're not there yet. Anyway, we learn from this covenant that God is merciful. So there are six covenants in Scripture that reveal the wonderful qualities of God's character. Here they are. His trustworthiness, his immutability, that is, he never changes, his holiness, his faithfulness, his love, and his 
mercy. Now, two of God's covenants required a priesthood. Some of this is a review, but we need to put everything together. The old covenant that God made with Moses was based on the law, the law of Moses, and the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. So remember when we talk about the Aaronic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood, it's the same priesthood Aaron was from the tribe of Levi. The new covenant was based on the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross. And his priesthood was after the order of Melchizedek. Well, we spent time with that several weeks back. Now, in chapters 5 through 10 of Hebrews, we learn why the priesthood of Jesus is superior to the old priesthood under Aaron and the Mosaic law. And why the new covenant will render the old covenant obsolete, as we'll see in our text today. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. So simply stated now, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. So let's kind of review where we've been in terms of why Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant and why his priesthood is superior to that of Aaron. So far in our study in Hebrews, we've learned that Christ's priesthood is superior to that of Aaron's or the Levitical priesthood. In that one, Christ's priesthood was forever because he lives on. Aaron's was temporary as priests died. So there were many, many priests and, you know, and some of them were evil too. But Christ's priesthood is forever. Secondly, Christ's priesthood was confirmed by an oath made by God. Aaron's was not. Christ's priesthood was founded on his personal greatness and his perfect life. Aaron's was founded by sinful men based on their heredity. You had to be from the line of Aaron. Christ's priesthood was founded on one sacrifice, which he offered once for all for the sins of men. Aaron's was founded on sacrifices offered daily in endless repetition. Christ's priesthood takes men into the presence of God and anchors them there forever. So you can come right into God's presence through Christ. Aaron's priesthood did not give one access to God. Christ's priesthood saves to the uttermost. Aaron's priesthood had no power to save. Christ, therefore, is superior, is the superior high priest who offers us a new and better covenant. So... What we want to do now is get into our text and learn about this new covenant, why it's better. So in the, the first six verses now of Hebrews chapter 8 is the proof of Christ's superiority as high priest. First uh, reason, Christ is superior, superior to all the other high priests, because he is seated. Notice verse 3. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying, the writer says. We have such a high priest who is seated, that's the key word here, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So the writer of Hebrews says we have now come to a chief point in our message, in, in, the, in the lesson that he's trying to teach the Jews. We've come to the focal point. The proof of Christ's superiority as high priest is that he is sitting down. Hmm. How so, you might say? Well, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, haven't got there yet, here's what we read. And every high priest stands, ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, referring to Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So the right hand was always the seat of honor. Now, here's what I want you to catch, because this gets exciting. In biblical Judaism, the ruling judicial body was called the Sanhedrin. It consisted of 70 members. So the Sanhedrin would be like our Supreme Court, the Jewish Supreme Court, 70 men. 
They were responsible for executing justice. There were always two scribes before the judges of the Sanhedrin. So they're taking notes. One scribe sat on his right hand and the other on his left. The scribe who sat on the right hand wrote the acquittals, whether or not this person is going to be free or not. While the one who sat on the left hand wrote the condemnations. Follow me? It was Jesus who said, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus' place at the Father's throne is not on the left side, which brings condemnation. He is sitting on the right hand of God, which brings salvation. Amen. Amen. Hey, okay, somebody's awake here. But it gets better because there's more. Yes, Jesus is sitting on the right hand of his Father's throne. But here's the exciting news. When we get to heaven, we too are going to sit on that throne. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him who overcomes will I grant to, to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Now, everybody who overcomes... Everybody who overcomes, that's you, that's me. We are going to be overcomers. We're going to sit on the throne of God with Jesus himself. And notice, we have to ask here, though, what is an overcomer? Well, he is one who overcomes the world. But listen to what John writes in 1 John 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God, if you're born of God, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ to the very end, you are an overcomer. And you will one day sit with Jesus on the throne. So those who put their faith in Jesus are overcomers. And what are they promised? Once we get to heaven, we will have the privilege of sitting on that throne where the Father and the Son are seated if that doesn't sound exciting to you, listen, church, then you must not have a heartbeat. <laughs> now, notice the clarification as well as the location of the throne. It is called the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So the day is going to come. Woo! The day is going to come. When we will travel further into outer space than any astronaut, we're going to fly past the atmospheric heavens, the stellar heavens, right into the third heaven where God himself dwells, and we're going to be in the very presence of the majestic one where we will sit on his throne. You see, we have a future. That's what I want us to understand. That ought to get us excited a little bit. We're not just a ball of flesh here on this earth. You know, we... Uh, we, 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 have, uh, we have special contact with God and we have special, He has special plans for us. So, notice now the clarification as well as the location. That's what I want us to deal with. Well, we already did that, so let's move on. The, the, uh, the first thing that, that we're talking about here is that Christ is superior to the other high priest. Why? Because he's seated. The other uh, high priests are always standing because their job is never done. Christ's job is done, so he sits down. See, that's the point. Secondly, Christ is superior because he ministers in the heavenly sanctuary. It says of Jesus, our high priest, that he is a minister. This is verse 2, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 2. He's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So in heaven... God has pitched his own sanctuary, which is called the true tabernacle. In that sanctuary, that is where Christ is a minister. So Christ is ministering to us in the true tabernacle or the sanctuary in heaven. Now, what does this word minister mean? 
The Greek word for minister is a compound word in the Greek. In other words, there are two Greek words that come together to make one word, which is the word minister. One of those words means belonging to the people. And the other word means to work. So the question is, what is a minister? A minister is one who works for the people. That's the responsibility of every pastor, see? It's to work for the people. But remember, you are ministers too because the responsibility of every pastor is to equip you for the work of ministry. I'm no more a minister than you are. You are as much a minister as I am, see? That doesn't mean you have the same role that I have, but it means you are a minister. Your responsibility is to work for the cause of the people of God, see? Whatever that might be. So even in heaven, Jesus in all his glory and magnitude is working for the people. Jesus was preoccupied with servanthood and ministering while he's here on earth, while he was here in the flesh. In heaven, things have not changed. Now he's ministering in the sanctuary, as we said, which is the true tabernacle. Now, the word translated sanctuary is the, is the uh, Greek word hagios, which means the holies. So he's ministering in the holies or the holy place. So God has a holy place in heaven where Jesus ministers and is ministering to us on earth. So the question is, how is he ministering to us? Well, let's look at verse 3 now of our text. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, Jesus, also have something to offer. We know the sacrifice he made for us, but what about the gift? So he's, he gave his life for us, that's the sacrifice, but more than that, he's giving gifts to us even as the priests of the Old Testament offered sacrifices and gifts. So the question now is, what's this all about? Well, in the Levitical priesthood, you see this in Leviticus chapter 2, chapter 6, in the Levitical priesthood, there were offerings to God other than sin offerings. Sin offerings had to deal with animal sacrifices. There was what was called a grain offering or a meal offering. It was an offering of praise and thanksgiving to God for providing the necessities of life. All praise to God goes through Jesus Christ because he is the one that has opened up for all who believe to have access to God. So the grain offering was offered by the priest as a gift to God for his bountiful provision. So get this now. Jesus, in the heavenly tabernacle, on our behalf is offering the gift of praise and thanksgiving to God. He's doing it for us. None of us can praise God. None of us can dedicate ourselves to God. None of us can worship God unless we do it through Jesus Christ. Even today, as Christ enters the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, he offers on our behalf praise and worship to the Father. We always come to God through Jesus. Christ continues even now to minister gifts to God. These gifts are our gifts of praise and thanksgiving. When you sing praises to God, when you pray praises to God, you are offering gifts to God, but Jesus is the one who's offering them on our behalf before the Father. You understand the point? There's sacrifices, there's gifts that the high priest would offer. So the writer of Hebrews then states this. I'm beginning at verse 4. For if he were on earth, talking about Jesus, if he were living today on earth, he would not be a priest. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in so much as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. Well, let's see if we can understand this. 
If Christ were on earth today, is what he's saying, he would not be a priest. Why? Because the priests all came from the tribe of Levi, while Christ came from the tribe of Judah. See? Christ was never intended to be an earthly priest, but a heavenly priest. The writer has been telling us that Christ ministers out of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected. And where is that look? It's located in heaven. Now this is in contrast with the tabernacle constructed by Moses. So we're going to draw some contrast now between the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness and this heavenly tabernacle where Christ ministers to us. Notice it says, he was to make all things according to the pattern that God would show. So Moses now, remember he's up on Mount Sinai, he's getting the law, but far more than receiving the law on Mount Sinai, that is Ten Commandments, he gets instructions about how to make a tabernacle. So God is going to show him exactly how he wants the tabernacle to be constructed. These instructions were given to Moses when he was on the mountain receiving the law. His tabernacle now was to be, notice, a copy and shadow of the real, true tabernacle that God erected in heaven. Follow what we're saying there? It was not the same tabernacle, obviously, because the real tabernacle is in heaven. Moses was to make, let's say, a model of that, a replica of that tabernacle on earth. And it's referred to as a copy or a shadow of the real tabernacle. There's one thing most interesting about the earthly tabernacle. I, I was going to draw this out for you, and I don't know why I didn't, uh, but you'll, you'll get the picture. The furniture in the tabernacle, in Moses' tabernacle, was arranged in the shape of a cross. Outside the tabernacle. So kind of picture a tabernacle. You know, a tent building. Whoop, whoop, like this, okay? Outside the tabernacle, at the east entrance to the tabernacle, there was first of all the brazen altar. That's where all the sacrifices were offered, on this brazen altar. Okay, you got that. Then in line with it, but before you go into the tabernacle, was what was called a laver. So after the priest offered these blood sacrifices, before he could ever go into the tabernacle itself, he had to purify himself with water at the laver. He had to wash his hands. He had to wash his feet. He had to get all the blood off of him from offering the sacrifice. Follow me? So he had to be purified. That took place at the laver. Now, let's go inside the tabernacle. As you move inside the tabernacle in a straight line, so we're still in a straight line, in front of the veil. Remember now the tabernacle had two rooms. A holy place, the holy of holies. There was a veil that separated the two rooms. In front of the veil in the holy place, the first room was the altar of incense. That was prayer because that smoke, the wreaths of smoke would aspire upward from that, that altar of incense. And as you move inside the tabernacle, you go inside now, uh, inside the Holy of Holies. Uh, oh, I'm uh, wrong here. I mean, I'm just in the wrong place. Okay. <laughs> what we want you to see then is behind the veil, behind the veil in the Holy of Holies was uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So, here's the tabernacle. Boop, boop, I like guess, you know. Outside, you have the brazen altar. Then you have the laver. Then, and then you go in in a straight line right in front of the uh, veil that separated the two rooms. There's the altar of incense. You go behind the veil. There's the Ark of the Covenant, which was a <coughs> symbol of the presence of God. Okay? Straight line. Now, the pieces of furniture forming the cross and directly across from each other where the golden lamp stand. So you go inside now into the uh, holy place of the uh, tabernacle. And on the left side, there was the golden lamp stand. 
And on the south, uh, there was the gold lamp on the south or left side, that's right. And on the north or the right side of the uh, holy of, holy of uh, the holy place was the table of showbread, and it was facing the candlestick, the golden candlestick. So you have the picture of the cross, like this. And that was uh, part of the tabernacle. The table of showbread would be symbolic of the Lord's Supper. We're going to go into this in great detail in a few weeks. And so I want to explain each piece of furniture in the tabernacle and how it relates to the church today. But uh, simply this, you have the sacrifice of Christ at the brazen altar. You have the purification uh, at the laver, which would be like water baptism, where you're being purified, so to speak, symbolically by the blood of Christ. You go... Uh, Inside and on one side you have the golden lampstand which symbolizes the uh, word of God. You have on the other side the table of showbread which represents the communion that we take every week. And then uh, you go further in you have the altar of, uh, of incense which symbolizes the prayers of the people. And then further you have the very presence of God behind the veil. But that's for another week. I'm going to lay all that out. But I want you to see there's a similarity between what took place in the tabernacle and what we do in the church today. Because the church, we, what do we read in the book of Acts? It says, and the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, that would be the golden candlestick, which is because the, the Bible is described or, uh, as a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. So the early church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. In fellowship, that would be the priests doing their, uh, their uh, job. Uh, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, uh, and in prayers, that would be uh, the altar of incense, and in breaking of bread, which would be the Lord's Supper. So all of that, you see, is part of the tabernacle. But uh, we'll, we'll go into that in far more detail later on. Anyway, when God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle, he required the brazen altar and labor, along with the inside furniture to be laid out in the form of a cross, as we've stated. That tabernacle was only a copy or a shadow of the true tabernacle that is in heaven from where Christ ministers even today. So get this, the true heavenly tabernacle in heaven also has the layout of the cross. So in heaven, there's the heavenly tabernacle, and in everything, all the furniture in that heavenly tabernacle is laid out in the form of a cross, just as the tabernacle on earth, all the furnishings, everything that went with it, is laid out in the form of a cross. With me? Okay, next. Notice Christ is superior because he's the better mediator. We're, we're in verse 6 now. Again, we ask, how is Christ ministering to us today? Well, he is the mediator of a better covenant, as the text says, which was established on better promises. So his ministry is referring, uh, is being referred to as being more excellent in this case. His ministry is a more excellent ministry. The writer is saying uh, to his Jewish readers, why are you still fooling around in the shadows when you can have the reality? See, they were, remember the, tabern, uh, the, the temple now in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem was still in operation when this letter was written. And what was happening, that there were Jews who were still going, there was a priesthood, they were still offering animal sacrifices at the temple. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, all of this is a shadow. The reality of things, the real thing, has already come. Why are you messing around with the shadow when you can have the reality? That's the question, see? Then he goes on to say, In Jesus you have a better mediator of a better covenant based on better promises. Christ is the better mediator than any Old Testament priest. So listen, we can understand this now. Paul tells us there's only one mediator between God and men, 
the man Jesus Christ. You see that in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. Now the word mediator means in the middle. So the mediator is one who stands in the middle of two opposing parties and brings them together. So here you have God on the one hand, man on the other hand. There's a separation between God and man because of sin. The mediator stands between God and man and brings the two together. See? That's the idea of the mediator. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 19, Paul uses the same Greek word to speak of Moses. Moses was a mediator. He was the mediator of the old covenant. Jesus is the perfect mediator of a better covenant. All that Moses could not do because of human weakness, Jesus does. He gives man direct access to God. This is something which the old economy, the old covenant under Moses could not accomplish. You don't need a priest or some dead saint or a pastor to get your prayers to reach the Father. The access to God through prayer is wide open for you to go directly to Him because you have in Jesus Christ the one mediator that makes God the Father immediately available to your urgent needs. You don't need to go to some Catholic priest and confess your sins. You don't need to come to me and confess your sins unless you sinned against me. If you cursed me out, you might want to come and say, Rod, I cursed you out. I'm sorry. And I'll say, I forgive you. Okay. Otherwise, if you didn't hurt me in any way, take your prayers to God okay, and do it through Jesus. The new covenant is not only based on a better mediator, as we're going to see here, it's based on better promises. This leads us now to the final section we're going to talk about today, verses 7 through 13. So, here's the problems. Now, in these verses, it's the problems of the old covenant and why, therefore, there is the need of the new covenant. That's, that's where we're headed now. Verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. The old covenant under Moses was faulty because it was operated by a priesthood that were sinners, some even evil men, like we talked about a few weeks ago. And no one priest was permanent because they all died. There were many priests after Aaron. The need for the one perfect high priest who lives on. There is that need. Therefore, there was a need for a new and better covenant. Now, this is going to get a little heavy here, but I think you're going to understand it, and it's going to make us rejoice. We want to talk about the nature of the new covenant. Why is the new covenant better than the old covenant? That's what we're looking at. We're going to pick up at verse 8 and read through the rest of the text we're going to study today. So this will be the longest reading from Scripture we'll have today, but I'll break it down. Let's read, starting at verse 8, Hebrews 8, verse 8. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. This, this is what's important. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother say, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Ah, I love this. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds. Get this now. I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. 
Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Okay, let's break this down. Let's see if we can comprehend this. The writer of Hebrews is quoting directly from the prophet Jeremiah. So he's taking a passage out of Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, and inserted it into his letter. No Jew should have been surprised that the old covenant under Moses and operated by the Aaronic priesthood would pass away and become obsolete. No Jew should have been surprised that a new covenant under which the Jewish people were to live was going to happen. Why should a Jew be surprised that the old covenant is passing away and the new covenant is coming? Why? Because it was prophesied by Jeremiah over 600 years before Christ was ever born. So if the Jewish people knew their scriptures, they would have known the old covenant would pass away and a new one would take its place. <coughs> so there needed to be a better covenant. And the Jew might say, who says so? And the writer of Hebrews, quoting Jeremiah, says, God said so. Notice, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So it's a new covenant. Now in the Greek language, there are a couple of words for new. So we need to find out what this word new means. There is neos, which focuses on time. A thing is described as new in the sense it newly arrived or is something just now happening. Like, for example, a 2023 model automobile is new. It's neos in that it just arrived after the 2022 models were shut down. So I want us to understand the meaning of the word new. New in the sense of time. It came after something. So it's new. Then there is canos, which refers to new in quality. It refers to an improvement over the old. The word that is used in our text to speak of the new covenant is the word canos. It is better than the old covenant. It's new in that it's better. See? Now let's look at this word covenant. The word in the book of Hebrews for covenant is uh, diakthaki. And it's not the typical word for covenant, which is sunthaki. So I want us to understand that the difference in these two words. That is a covenant made between equals. So the word sunthaki is a covenant made between equals. It's the most typical word. It's a word that would be used in a marriage covenant where a man and a woman who are equals come together in marriage. The writer of Hebrews, therefore, is emphasizing by the word diathaki that this is not an agreement among equals. God and man will never enter into an agreement on equal terms. God doesn't come to us and says, Hey, buddy, let's be equal partners in this contract. Absolutely not. God authored the covenant. There is no give and take in it. There is no bartering of terms. He is the superior one, and he is making it to his chosen people who are vastly inferior to him. No one has a right to argue the terms of this contract. So, here's what I want us to understand about the New Covenant, the New Testament, which is what we study here, the New Testament. It's new in that it's better than the old. And the word covenant means the one who made the covenant is superior to the one who has to follow the covenant. God is superior to us, and we have no say-so of the agreements of this covenant. We simply have to follow it. Did I get that point across? Yeah. Notice next, the newness and betterment of the covenant. It goes on. So what's new about this covenant? 
In other words, why is it a better covenant? That's the point we want to ask. Why is the New Testament message better than the Old Testament? We've already learned the new is better than the old. And it is a contract between two unequal parties. God, its author, and the house of Israel, its compiler. Why the need of the new covenant? And why is it better? That's our question now. So with this, we're going to wrap up our lesson. First of all, it was established on better promises. The new covenant is established on better promises. Notice verse 6. He, Jesus, is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established, notice, on better promises. So how is this so? Let's talk about these promises. It is new and better. This covenant is a new and better covenant based on internal motivation and power instead of an external list of do's and don'ts. I want you to follow me now. It's going to get a little heavy. Notice verse 10. It says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. With me now? So the new covenant is internal. The old covenant was what? External. It was based on laws that were written in stone. With me? So in the old economy, everything was external. The law was written on stone. In the new covenant, the law is written in our hearts. Now, now this becomes important to understand. John writes that as believers we have, notice, the anointing which you have received from him and abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it is true, and it is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Ah, what's this all about? We have an anointing. You have an anointing. I have an anointing that teaches us from the inside. Now, how is this so? We have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's, it wouldn't it seem strange that John would say, you do not need that anyone teach you. Well then, if that's true, why am I teaching you? Okay? If that's true, we don't need a teacher. If we don't need a teacher, why is one of the spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit the gift of teaching? So here's John saying, you don't need anyone to teach you. I'm teaching you. Am I wrong to do that? Or, or to even carry it uh, a bit further, we have the spiritual gift of teaching. See, some people have the gift of teaching. So how do we, how do we put all this together? Jesus told his disciples that when the Holy Spirit comes, remember, and then dwells the believer, that he, that is the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So the Holy Spirit now, who indwells us, is our teacher. All of us need good Bible teachers, so there would be no need for the spiritual gift of teaching. So we need to understand the context of John's words. Let's go back one verse before that. 1 John chapter 2, verse 26. Here's what it says. I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Ah, there are false teachers out there. There are teachers who want to deceive you. Now here's what he said. A person who has truly been born again and lives with the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit should never be doctrinally deceived. The Holy Spirit is there to warn you that what you are hearing is not the true gospel. It's false teaching. It's teaching that is intended to draw you away from the faith. You should not have to have some teacher tell you that you're being fooled. So when you hear somebody on Trinity Broadcast teach false doctrine, the Holy Spirit in you is going to raise a little signal in your heart and say, hey, this guy is not true to the word of God. I better not follow what he's asking. See? The Holy Spirit is teaching you in the sense he does not want you to be deceived by false teachers. 
Otherwise, you need to be taught because there's a spiritual gift to teach you. See, and it's my responsibility too. And we've certainly done it in this class over the years that I've been teaching it. To teach way, what, what, are, what false teachers are out there and what those false teachers are teaching. In fact, I have a whole chapter in my book on false teachers. Whole chapter. In fact, that she's got a few. Uh, we have a couple copies of the book. If you didn't get it, kind of just hold up the book there. And I forgot to make this announcement. Uh, this book goes for twenty bucks. Hidden enemies in the ministry. What I've learned in sixty years of ministry that I never learned in seminary. A whole chapter on false teachers and why we need to be aware of what they're teaching and stay away from. It, see? So uh, if you're interested, I know some are new here, so if you're interested, I have a few copies, and uh, it's $20. If you get it on uh, Amazon, it's $25, bucks, 24 bucks plus shipping, so I'll save you a little. Anyway, I'm not here for that. Let's move on. This is false teachers, and I just brought that chapter to my mind, okay? So this new covenant, Promises, uh, promises now and in, an internal. This is what I want you to see. This new covenant promises an internal motivation in the Holy Spirit with His power to live for God. So it answers the feeling that's out there. I can't measure up. I can't keep all those commandments of God. And the answer is yes, you can measure up. You have the internal motivating power of the Holy Spirit to keep you right with God and to keep you from falling into deception. The best teacher there is resides in you. The best teacher there is resides in you. And he is also your helper, Jesus said. So the Holy Spirit teaches us in the sense that he warns us what you're hearing right now is false doctrine. Stay away from it. Otherwise, we need teachers. Okay? Next, two. It is a new and better covenant based on a close relationship with God instead of one that is fearful and distant. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. That's verse 10. Under the old covenant, there was always the fear of God rejecting them for their disobedience. In verse 9, we read where God led the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, Because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. So when Israel went pouring after other gods, God told the prophet Hosea concerning Israel, You are not my people, and I am not your God. We don't want to be deceived. But when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, what happened? they started following false gods. That's the context of this. And so you're going to follow false gods. God says, you're not my people. And a divorce is beginning to take place between God and the nation of Israel. Remember, we had a whole lesson on that in the book of Isaiah. How God's filing for divorce. So this new covenant promises a close relationship with God. It answers the feeling that someone might have. I'm afraid of God. Keep me at a distance from him. But God wants a relationship and there's no need to fear him. Thirdly, it is a new and better covenant in that it applies to all mankind and not just to the Jews. Notice verse 11. For all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them. The old covenant was strictly for the Jews. The new covenant is universal. And all shall know me. The Gentiles are part of the new covenant through the faith of Abraham. God told Abraham that through his seed all the nations would be blessed. That, uh, I think in your notes it should be a small h on his as opposed to a capital I. Caught that this morning. Anyway, that's Genesis 12, verse 5. That blessing came in the person of Jesus Christ who died for the sins of the whole world. The Old Testament sacrifices under the Levitical priesthood were for Jewish believers only. And they temporarily removed sin. No Gentile benefited from the Old Covenant. Understand that? Of course, we have the, the Ten Commandments and we need to follow the moral teachings, but... 
basically the uh, the old covenant was for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. God told the Galatians and the Scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed, so that those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. So this new covenant promises salvation for the Gentiles and answers the feeling that someone might have I never know for certain where I stand with God. It gives you solid confidence of your salvation. If you have faith like Abraham, whose faith drew him close to God, or he is called a friend of God, then you ought to have absolute confidence and absolute assurance as to your standing with God. Is God your very best friend? I hope so. If so, then you ought to know your standing with God. That standing being that you are his child, and you are saved, and when this life is over with, you go directly into his presence. You should know that, church. Fourth, it is a new and better covenant in that it emphasizes permanent forgiveness and mercy instead of failure and wrong. Notice verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds. Love this verse. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawlessness. I will remember no more. So under the old covenant, sins were temporarily forgiven. But they were never forgotten. In the new covenant, God says through the perfect sacrifice of Christ as our great high priest, all our sins for all time are not only forgiven, but they are forgotten. He said, I will remember them no more. Whoa! Now that's the whole doctrine of justification. As far as I'm concerned, this is uh, certainly one of the greatest doctrines of the Bible. What, what is the doctrine of justification? I have been forgiven of all past sins, all present sins, and all future sins, the very moment I surrendered my life to Christ. Isn't that great? You see, when I surrender my life to Christ, I come under the blood of Jesus, which day by day by day cleanses me from all sin for all time. As 1 John 1 said, the word justification can be understood as total acquittal and vindication before a holy God. This means I am viewed by God just as if I'd never sinned at all. You realize that's how God sees you. God sees you as though you never sinned. Never sinned. Why? Because Christ took your sins upon himself and paid the penalty for it. The Apostle Paul developed this doctrine in the first five chapters of Romans. Paul begins his argument by showing that no human being is righteous before God. That's the first three chapters. Since all are sinners, salvation can come only if God acts to justify. That is, to pronounce, to declare sinners righteous. In chapter 3, he announces a righteousness from God that is given freely by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul shows that the substitutionary death of Christ provided a basis on which God can make this judicial pronouncement. As human beings, we always fall short of the divine standard of righteousness. Therefore, humanity's only hope, our only hope, is a righteousness that comes apart from human action. In other words, we are, we are, we've been imputed with the righteousness of Christ. That's why God can declare us to be justified. We wear his righteousness because we're not righteous. In chapter 4 of Romans, Paul uh, goes back in history and speaks of Abraham, who believed God, and it was cited to him as righteousness. Paul goes on to say that justification has always come through faith and not through human effort to live by the law. In Galatians 2.16 he says, knowing that a man is not justified, is not justified by the, should be justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus 
that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no man shall be justified. Then comes the great promise of God from Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this new covenant promises that God will forgive all of our sins for all time and remember them no more. It, uh, it answers the feeling that people have. I am guilty as charged before God and I can't solve the sin problem. That is true under the law. But by faith in all that Jesus has done for you and for me, your sin problem has been resolved. You are more than forgiven. You are justified before God. All your past, present, and future sins have been forgiven, and God's righteousness has been bestowed on you. Amen. Amen. That is why Paul says there is no need for a new, uh, that is why Paul says there is a need, rather, for a new and better covenant. He has made the old obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Remember, the old covenant was still in existence when this epistle to the Hebrews was written. Still in existence. Why? Because the temple had not yet been destroyed and animals were still being sacrificed. But the writer of Hebrews has some insight into all of this and he says it's obsolete, it's growing old, and it's soon going to vanish away. So when did it vanish away? Well, in AD 70, remember Titus of Rome marched his troops into the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and put an end to the priesthood. So there's no longer an ironic or Levitical priesthood because the temple was destroyed. I'm glad that I live under the new and better covenant and not the old one. Aren't you? Amen. Okay.